My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I'm pleased to see all of you here this evening and to welcome our guests. Our first presenter, Ken Kalfas, is no stranger to great praise. His novel, The Commissariat of Enlightenment, was a New York Times notable book of the year. His second, A Disorder Peculiar to the Country, was a National Book Award nominee. And his story collection, PU 239 and Other Russian Fantasies, was a Penn Faulkner Award finalist. His latest collection, Coup de Foudre, begins with an eponymously titled story, which Andrew Sean Greer, writing in Sunday's Times, called Spectacular. He went on to laud Kalfas for, quote, daring to imagine the unimaginable, unquote. If you've read Ken, you know that daring is an apt description of some of his other works as well. In addition to being the president and publisher of Far Strauss and Giroux, our second presenter, Jonathan Galassi, is, the author of, is also the author of acclaimed poetry collections, Left Handed, North Street, and Morning Run. He is also a poetry critic and translator, as well as a former Guggenheim Fellow and Paris Poetry Editor. When you snap open tomorrow's New York Times, you'll find a review of Mr. Galassi's novel, Muse, the story of a decades-long publishing feud, which critic Michiko Kakutani calls a keenly observed debut that gives readers a tactile portrait of the New York literary world in the good old days, when publishing was a gentlemanly profession and books were books with glued or even sewn bindings, and their contents were liquor, perfume, sex, and glory to their devotees. What are we waiting for? Please welcome our first presenter, Ken Kalfas. Okay, th th thank you, Andy, and uh, thanks everyone for coming out, and there's a real Pleasure to be here, as usual, at the Free Library, and a real honor to be here with uh, Jonathan Galassi, um, one of the great editors of our time. And um, uh, I, in probably in honor of what he's going to be reading tonight, his, of his book, which is about publishing, I thought I would read tonight something also about, uh, I think, might dovetail well, the other, another part of the process, um, not the publishing part, the, um, the writing part. So... Uh, Hopefully, you'll, you'll, uh, this will all work out, the two of us together. The, the story is called The Un. There were hundreds of ways to go crazy wanting to be a writer. And as a young man, Joshua Glory learned them all. He learned that you go crazy worrying about your origins. Josh didn't know of a single great writer who had emerged from suburban mire, as pedestrian as his. You could go crazy imitating the early lives of great writers, for example, seeking adventure, romance, danger, and alienation. You could go crazy moving to the far side of a slum adjacent to the bohemian neighborhood of a prohibitively expensive city and trying to write while taking on dull, divisively paid jobs on the fringes of the fringes of the fringes of writing, like proofreading event listings for a free weekly newspaper. You go crazy searching for the perfect desk. You go, cra you go crazy arranging the desk's position to provide you with the softest, brightest light and the most inspiring view, either of the pinched, cracked street or the single shelf of your paperback library. You go crazy scrutinizing how-to books for the single secret key to literary success purposely concealed, Kabbalah-like, with, within them. You go crazy trying to write in the style of an author you had, admired. You go crazy trying not to write in the style of an author you admired. You go crazy trying to explain to other people what you were working on. You go crazy worrying that someone else was writing something similar to what you were writing and would publish it the very day you finished your final draft. You go crazy thinking that what you were writing would be read by total strangers, or even worse, by your parents. You go crazy thinking they would not be read at all. You go nuts rereading your work over and over until the words were dissolved of meaning. You could unbalance yourself rewriting 
trying to find the absolutely correct and pre precise phrase that would express what was, unfortunately, only a fuzzy idea. You go bonkers trying to get the attention of some agent, any agent, or, so, or some editor, any editor, or some published writer, any published writer, you know, a lousy one, who could help get you published. Looking for nuance in letters of rejection would cross your eyes, loosen your screws, and displace your marbles, especially the letters were form letters. An entire ward at the home for the literary and sane was occupied by people who insisted on favorably likening their evening and weekend scribbling to the work of the world's most accomplished writers. Another ward was for people who compared their work to that of inferior writers who had nevertheless published. Something snapped when they tried to account for the appearance of these mediocrities in print. It required a bloodlessly cynical theory of publishing, or even more, a nihilist genuflection before the mechanisms of an, of, an, of an amoral universe. You go crazy waiting for inspiration. You go crazy searching for a true indication of your talent. You go crazy waiting for the mail. Josh stared at the mail slot across the room this morning, waiting for it to disgorge its acknowledgement that he was indeed a writer. It could come any time late morning or the early afternoon, if not later or if not earlier. Every day there was hope and that hope stretched the day into a desert of time without horizon. Now, with a few scraps of his hardly begun novel scattered on his desk next to his seafoam blue portable typewriter, Josh's impatience was even greater than usual. The novel whose sentences had been eminently legible to his mind just the day before had vanished like a fair weather cloud. He had filled up page after page with notes, but none were part of the novel as he conceived it. Several of the plot developments he had counted on were illogical or self-contradictory. The whole idea of the book now seemed preposterous. If only he were already a published author, how much easier writing would be. If only he had a first novel on the shelf, how pleasurable it would be to write the second, the third, and the 27th. Then he had the confidence to sit down and work without this distracting suspicion that what he wrote was completely worthless or perhaps malign. He would be assured that his words would inevitably appear in print between covers. Now the vast bulk of his oeuvre was only in photocopied samizdat, passed on to relatives and friends. In response, they offered cautious praise while Josh pressed, while Josh pressed them to tell him what you really think. And even when they told him and praised him, he wondered if they were lying and later behind his back, laughing or sadly shaking their heads. So he waited for the mail to confirm that he was on the right track. The mail had been entrusted with his short stories, his first chapters, his book outlines, his critical and political essays, his, his casuals and occasionals, his nature meditations, his article proposals, his travel accounts, his op-eds, and most recklessly, his verse. He hoped that today it would repay his tender devotion with a letter of acceptance. He stared at the mail slot, then out the window, then momentarily at the typewriter, then back at the mail slot, and through the window again. Something eclipsed the far end of the trash can lined alley across the street, which ran in shadow to the next block. He played the blur several times through his mind, trying to identify within it the glitter of a keychain and the smear of color that represented the national Postal Service. The mailman's route to the next block, Joshua discovered the week he moved in, carried him past the opening of the alley precisely 16 minutes before he turned onto Josh's street and reached his door. The transit, however, occurred in less than a second. It was easy for Josh to miss if he was not staring through the window down the alley at the time, and even easier for him to worry that he had missed it. His vigilance, he morosely admitted, was excessive. It was not unusual for him to suffer at least one or two false alarms every day. After every false sighting, he would involuntarily count off the 16 minutes, aware that he couldn't credit it as productive work time. Once a period, elapsed, period elapsed, he would suffer another two minutes of disappointment, tension, and deflation. 
If we missed the mailman's actual approach and never thought about it, then the carrier's arrival would be a happy surprise. The letters and magazines exploding through his door slot. Josh maintained a superstitious belief that his best mail days, that is, days in which the rejection slips were faintly encouraging, individually written letters, were ones in which he had anticipated the mail's arrival at all. As if the creative spark that had lit the idea for, the, for a short story and the agonizing care he had taken to execute it were less important than not remembering the daily postal delivery. He consulted his digital watch, which lay on the desk between his notes and his typewriter. Three minutes had passed since he had seen the mailman, or thought he had seen him. Josh had once owned a stand, standard wind-up clock. The ticking bothered him. Or rather, it wasn't the ticking that bothered him, but the pauses between the ticks. He found himself waiting for the next tick, just as he was now waiting for the mailman. This was, this was ridiculous that a real writer immersed in his work wouldn't notice a church bell going off in his study. He stared, he stared now at the watch for a moment longer, and then at the window, and then back at the typewriter. He wrote two sentences, neither of which, strangely enough, had to do with mailman, mailmen or church, or church bells, but with his novel. They were wonderful sentences. He further saw the shape of the two sentences after them, their syntax, their syntax and meter, if not the actual words, plus that of the plot several pages ahead. Exhilarated, he began typing the third sentence, but its phrasing momentarily stymied him. Josh glanced at the watch and saw that this burst of creativity had consumed nine minutes, for a total of 12 minutes since he had first seen the mailman, if that's who it was, at the end of the, the, end of the alley. The hell with the mail. Josh would, have, Josh would gladly have allowed whatever items the mailman was to deliver within the next four minutes to molder inside the door, nearly at his desk, unexamined the rest of the week, if he could occupy that time as lost in composition as he had just been. I'm concentrating, he told himself. I'm writing. Josh stared at this congratulatory thought halfway through the third sentence. Josh, I'm sorry, Josh arrived at this congratulatory, congratulatory thought halfway through the third sentence, by which time it was no longer true. He stared at this then sentence, completed it, and regretted that his predicate had neither the fluency nor the heft that he had originally envisioned. Another few minutes passed. He made a space to begin another sentence. He reread he re the paragraph so far. It was all right. What was next? And where was the mailman? The 16 minutes had come and gone. The carrier should have, arri the carrier should have arrived by now, even if he had been delayed between the other block and this one by a package or registered letter. Josh considered stepping outside to look for him, but that would have been a sure jinx. The mailman was still on his way against an abundant postal harvest. It would do nothing to increase his literary output. But to continue to wait was also a formidable distraction. Let's face it, he wasn't doing any writing now. He could hardly locate in the frontal space of his consciousness exactly what he was working on. Josh pushed his chair back walked across the room and opened the door. It was the first time he had been outside today. The flood of fresh air was a taunt. He looked up and then down the, down the unswept little street, which was lined with wounded automobiles parked on fractured sidewalks stained by spilled oil. At the end of the block was a mailman who had passed by Josh's door without stopping. Josh hadn't received anything, not even an advertising circular. This was unprecedented. His subscriptions to several magazines and literary journals hadn't won him special consideration as a potential contributor, but they guaranteed a nearly constant inflow of periodicals, at, and, uh, periodicals and placed him on mailing lists that generated further subscription offers. Plus, he received the normal human allotment of utility bills. But today, for the first time since he moved here, the cycles of magazine delivery, subscription campaigning, utility billing, submission rejection, and personal correspondence had met in a perfectly congruent trowel. If something had come, Josh probably would have been disappointed with it, but at least he would have been satisfied that the day's mail had given him a fair shake. No mail at all simply prolonged by another 24 hours the waiting for mail that should have come today. Josh watched the back of the mailman for a few minutes as he delivered to his, neighbor, to, as he delivered to his neighbors 
their sentences, their galleys, and their royalty checks. You go crazy wanting to be a writer. You, you, I'm sorry, you go so crazy wanting to be a writer that the struggle to get published became the principal theme of your life and work. You could lose interest in family dynamics, the legacy of history, the interplay of chance and destiny, the bitter mysteries of romantic love, and the costs of personal ambition, all dependably productive literary themes. You could find yourself disinclined to read literature that grappled with ordinary human affairs or talk with friends about sporting events, politics, and their personal dramas. You become concerned instead only with what it meant to be an unpublished writer. You could find yourself writing about this obsession, trying to distill the compromises and humiliations and false victories you had endured to a single narrative testimony. Mostly you would want to express your sense that in creation there is but a single wall, the wall that separated the published from the un, and that somehow getting over it, around it, or through it was the only worthwhile human endeavor. You could make up a character intent on overcoming this barrier, a character very much like yourself, though perhaps one a touch less delusional. With the possibility of receiving an acceptance today extinguished, Josh fell into a black mood, sure that he would never see another line in print again. He had written eight short stories that he considered worthy of publication. One of them had appeared two years earlier in a small literary quarterly that had since folded, published by a university that, had, that then lost its accreditation, <laughs> located in a state that shortly afterward seceded from the Union. <laughs> the other stories were currently lying in seven cartons in the offices of seven journals whose names Josh had expunged from his short memory from a short-term memory out of an elaboration of his belief that success would come only as a surprise. Having decided that they were publishable, Josh wouldn't allow the stories to remain at home. When one came back rejected, he sent it out again that, that day, restoring within hours the manuscript's acceptance to the realm of the possible. It's a limit to how often he could be able to do this. After a short story had been returned 10 or 12 times, in envelopes treacherously addressed by his own hand, the stamps are fixed with his own self-defeating saliva. <laughs> it acquired a patina of rejection through which he could hardly read the words. Every doubt he'd ever, he'd ever entertained about the story was magnified. Every difficult decision he'd ever made about character formulation, plot development, or, world, or word choice was shown to be a mistake. Josh never submitted a story to more than one publication at a time. For one thing, he didn't want to offend the publishing authorities who not only frowned upon this practice, but according to literary self-help books, condemned writers to an anonymity for lesser infractions. These included sending a title page with a manuscript, sending a photocopy or carbon, single triple spacing, and telephoning publication for two or three months to inquire what had become of the manuscript. Furthermore, and this was truly ridiculous, for all his profound doubts about the story, his disgust at the artificiality of his dialogue and the plot, his dismay at the insubstantiality of his characters, above all his embarrassment, his audacity in thinking that he was a writer, the moment Josh dropped the manuscript into the mailbox and softly whispered, good luck, he, he truly believed the journal to which he was submitting the story would publish it. He feared that if he sent the story to, say, four literary quarterlies at the same time, all four would accept it. Why shouldn't they? It was a great story. And he'd be in the uncomfortable position of having to write back the three of them to withdraw the manuscript. And who knew what editorial wrath that would occur, would incur. He sensed, too, deep in his bones, this confidence in the story, as ephemeral as it might have been, was an element necessary to the entire foolish enterprise. Drawing from a different pool of emotions, Josh also sympathized with the editors of these publications. He knew that a typical editor was some underpaid, literature-loving academic sentenced to facing 20 or 30 barely readable manuscripts on the floor under his mail slot every day of, of his working life. Manuscripts from desperate people who not only didn't read the obscure quarterly, Circulation 300, for which he was sacrificing his eyesight, but hadn't even correctly spelled the title of the publication on the envelopes, which as likely as not arrived without return postage. Occasionally, one of the editors own rejected poems or short stories sent back from an obscure quarterly that he didn't read would be mixed in with the day's mail. By sending out only a single carefully typed copy of each story at a time, a meticulously addressed envelope, 
always accompanied by a self-addressed stamped envelope. By buying and sometimes reading the most trivial of these quarterlies, Josh intended to improve the position of editors everywhere and indirectly the status of writers and even more indirectly and speculatively his own. Thank you. I'll, there's more to that. to follow the scabrous Ken Kalfas who writes things about self-defeating saliva, et cetera. That's, and I think, but I think these pages might prove a lot of Josh's fantasies, worst fantasies true. This is, a, my book is called Muse and it's about two old publishers from the old days who hate each other and love hating each other, and who are both obsessed with a poet, a woman named Ida Perkins, who, who they both think is the ultimate writer for them. And it just shows you how fractured this little story is, that the, the, the writer they're most obsessed with is a poet. <laughs> so, um, so it's, it's slightly, it's just a little bit outsized, just the way Ken's is, in a different direction though. So this is a scene that takes place in the publishing house, Purcell and Stern, that's run by one of them, whose name is Homer Stern. And there's a young editor named Paul Dukach who works for him, and who is also obsessed with Ida Perkins for reasons of his own. This is called Sunny Days at PNS. How was your weekend, dearie? Read anything, read anything interesting? Paul, who'd been back at work for a few weeks, was sitting in Homer's corner office with him and Sally, his assistant, as they did most mornings after she'd taken Homer's dictation. The company's ratty style extended to the boss's inner sanctum which though larger than the other offices and furnished with a conference table <laughs> and a dirt encrusted Danish modern desk and two sweat stained aquamarine leather armchairs was every bit as shabby as the rest of the premises. The cracked linoleum floor was waxed fairly often filth and all so it was shiny as well as grubby. 30-year-old curtains of a beige <laughs> indistinguishable from dinge framed windows overlooking Union Square, which was currently in experiencing a renaissance that had made it the teenage hangout capital of Manhattan. Now, instead of users scoring at the foot of the Civil War monument in the center of the park, recovering users competed with after-schoolers, dog walkers, and the occasional hardy passerby for seats on the too few benches. Not much, Paul answered, a few no-count novels. When is that Momser Burns going to finish his book? He owes us a small fortune. If he'd laid off, if he'd lay off stripping that girl of his with a ring in her nose and get down to work, we'd all be a lot better off. <laughs> That's a bindi Angeli wears on her forehead, Homer. Earl phoned last week to say he's about to deliver. Homer's banter with Paul kept things lively and safely impersonal between them. His constant stream of gossip, especially the sexual variety, invariably contained juicy tidbits about whoever was current on his ever-active ever shit list. David, Davidoff is a faggot, he'd assert more or less out of thin air, or I hear that cocksucker Stevens is boff boffing both his secretaries. When the nympho finds out, she'll have a vaginal collapse. Homer was an equal opportunity offender when it came to others' proclivities, though cocksucker was a term reserved exclusively for heterosexuals. Ethnicity wasn't one of his prime categories of derision, but he did enjoy poking fun at the piece of fluff 
that Gerald Byrne had brought over from Paris on his most recent annual visit. What, what was it wearing, the boss would ask, about someone whose sexuality was a little too fluid according to his antediluvian standards? I don't believe people do all the things you say they do, Homer. They couldn't possibly, Paul would object, when Homer cataloged the shenanigans of his foes and friends, to which Homer would counter, no, but they do something, which was hard to deny. Sexual activity for Homer was an index of moral fallibility and vitality at one and the same time. It didn't matter what people did. He was sure they did something illicit. It meant they were alive, like him. Maybe he was simply looking for companionship in transgression. Homer had been a varsity sexual athlete in his prime, according to Georges Savoy, his partner, who told Paul that Star that Stern would often return from lunch with wet hair. For years, he had a special wire in his office. Originally installed, it was rumored for secret government contacts. Now, though, the old black rotary phone rang only when a woman friend from out of Homer's colorful past checked in. Then Sally, his secretary, would stand in the hall and intone, your phone is ringing. She refused to answer it herself. Homer was reputed to have maintained a pied a terre near the office where he would repair for nooners from among, uh, sometimes allegedly three ways recruited, but how from among the staff. Sex was PNS's best, indeed its only sport. The softball team was famously terrible, and it was Homer who set the tone. Put, the, put this in with your smalls, he'd tell his rights director, Cherry Withington, on her way to Frankfurt, tossing her the galleys of a new book. Sex was recreation for him, a healthy, immensely satisfying pastime, and he was an avid tennis player, too, well into his 80s. For all his profanity and bedroom, bedroom antics, though, Homer was a relative prude when it came to misbehaving on the page. He was no Barney Rossett the swashbuckling, boundary-testing founder of Grove Press, who braved the censorship laws bringing out Lady Chatterley's Lover, The Story of O, and other lubricious classics. Sex scenes in the novels Homer published made him uncomfortable, though he was convinced, erroneously for the most part, that they sold books. Paul could tell who Homer's old flames had been by how courtly he was with them, Loyal in a way he was with no one else, not authors, relations, or even his best foreign confederates. Sex with Homer seemed to lead to friendship, perhaps the most unambivalent relationships he had. He was a ladies' man, and not just in the accepted sense of the term. Women seemed to offer him a solace that was missing from his noisy, yet inarticulate sparring with men. It was impossible for Homer to be really close to another male. His Neanderthal instinct was too strong. He boasted about his affection for his authors, the three aces in particular. But when Paul joined them for lunch, as he was invited to, because Homer, he sensed, was an uncomfortable one-on-one, -on -one, the conversation often ended up, being super, ended up being superficial, if not inane a terrible waste when three of the leading writers in the world were sitting at the table. Homer, for all his impact, was a man of a few words, many of them unprintable, which got repeated over and over in ingenious combinations. And so forth and so on was how his stories tended to trail off with a dismissive wave. Let's go make a book, was how he brought lunch to a close. What Homer thrived on most was having enemies. Nothing gave him more pleasure than cutting dead a foreign employee, a former employee, a deserter, and hence a non-person, or providing a denigrating comment about a competitor to the Daily Blade. In his days doing Army PR, he learned that it didn't matter what you said as long as you were quoted. He had a series of rubber stamps for unwelcome correspondence, which he'd return with great moments in literature, or horseshit pie, or best of all, fuck you very much, smudged in black 
big black letters across the pages. He delighted in accusing Sandy Eisenberg, the pint-sized president of Owl House, of boorishness, making bellicose public sallies that left Sandy, a short man, unaccustomed to opposition of any kind, sputtering with rage. Best of all, though, was fighting with agents, those par parasites who interfered with his private relations with his property, i.e. his authors. Paul, who felt it was advisable to get along with people if possible because you might want to or need to do business with them in the future, now and again suggested it might be politic to reestablish relations with Agent X, who had incurred Homer's ire years ago by selling a book he'd wanted to Ferris Strauss or Knopf. Don't give me that Christian forgiveness bullshit, Dukach. I'm a vindictive Jew, he'd bellow. End of joke. Another classic Homer Stern way of closing a conversation. One agent who loomed in his imagination was Angus McTaggart, with whom Homer, enjo Homer enjoyed a long-standing sadomasochistic bromance. McTaggart who professed to adore Homer, adored working his way through Homer's catalog even more, signing up his unrepresented or badly represented writers and then demanding oversized improvements in their compensation for their next books, which Homer delighted in being outraged about. Most of the writers ended up staying on terms that made publishing them unprofitable for Homer, but some of the bigger ones did occasionally leave for greener pastures like A. Burak after he finally hit it big with his big Brooklyn novel, A Patch on Bernie. <laughs> Homer would thunder and swear and refuse to take Angus's call for a few weeks or months. Then Angus would take him out to lunch, grovel apologetically and pick up the check, an unheard of de deviation from the publisher agent quadrille and the cycle would start up again. <clears throat> Homer loved winning and loved seeing others lose even more, but he also enjoyed the game for its own sake, and he was extraordinarily good at it. He had created a highly articulated organism and employed the diversionary color of his personality, his personality effectively in its service, unless he got carried away, as he quite often did, by his emotions. His employees felt to him like illegitimate children, they were the best in the business because they were his. He was no intellectual and didn't pretend to be, though he read or sniffed, as he put it, all the books he published. He was an amateur in the original sense of the word. He loved writing and writers. And he was unmatched at the one thing that mattered to them more than anything, even money. He could get them talked about. <clears throat> Now, having more or less recovered from his agon with, with the notebooks of a writer named uh, Arnold Outerbridge, Paul mentioned to Homer and Sally that he wanted to meet Ida Perkins, uh, the, the poet that he loves so much. So um, I'm going to skip ahead a little. Uh, and, and have this read you one other scene. Um, having Ida at PNS would be an enormous coup for both him and, and uh, Homer. He wondered if it could ever happen. He, sh he shouldn't even be thinking about it. The mere thought was disloyal to Sterling Wainwright, the other publisher who published her. But he was a publisher, wasn't he? A few days later, as if on the spur of the moment, he put in a call to Ida's agent, Roz Horowitz, a canny old bird who he felt had always had a soft spot for him, and asked her to lunch. So tell me about Ida Perkins, Roz. What's the news? Paul asked as they sipped their white wine at Bruno's, the overpriced midtown watering hole favored by the big publishers before they made their mass exodus to lower Manhattan in the mid to late teens. 
On this particular afternoon, Knopf's editorial whiz, Jazz Busby, one of the banes of Paul's existence, was having lunch with the nympho in one corner, while in the back of the room, Angus McTaggart was leaning over the table, whispering conspiratorially to his new client, Oren Roden, no doubt plotting about how to move him from PS, PNS to Owl House, or somewhere with even bigger pockets, as would soon happen. You know, so, so tell me about Ida Perkins Ross. You know she's always been my favorite poet. Get in line, darling. Rose was a diminutive butterball of a woman whose legs didn't quite reach to the floor when she was sitting in her chair. She had several chins and a large pile of hennaed hair pinned on top of her head, oversized sunglasses, and wore bright red lipstick. That and a nickel will buy you exactly nothing. Ida Perkins is everybody's favorite poet, and you know it. Well, not quite everyone's. I never understood why she and Elspeth Adams were so standoffish. You didn't? I thought you said you knew poets. They have their cliques and their clacks, their jealousies and their sworn enmities, like all artists. If you go for Stravinsky, you're not going to be too popular with Schoenberg. Take that bastard hummock. He's always talking down his so-called friend Roden over there. It's human nature. I suppose you're right. Sometimes I think it's visceral, biological even, as if they can't stand each other's smell. Watch it, kiddo. Ida Perkins doesn't smell. She's as pure as a rose. I know she's perfect, Roz, and not only because she's your client. I yield to no one in my admiration of Ida Perkins, but a rose does have a wonderful rich odor and thorns too, the last time I checked. I bet even the perfect Ida Perkins has had her dissatisfactions over the years. How happy is she with her publisher? Roz gave Paul an even stare. You know very well she's been with your new best buddy, Sterling Wainwright, more or less her whole life. Yes, of course, I wouldn't dream of interfering with a blissful relationship. I was just curious about how it's gone from her perspective. The usual ups and downs, but I'm not sure I could imagine Ida anywhere else. Of course not. Paul retreated to his previous line of questioning. Have you ever discussed Miss Perkins' work with your sister? Aren't we curious today? Hebe and I don't talk business. We've got enough to contend with dealing with our aged parents and each other. I know she thinks the world of Ida, though, Everyone with any taste does. I wouldn't be surprised if she wrote a book about her someday. I don't think she's so sure about Elizabeth Adams. Elspeth, if you say so, how pretentious can you get, Roz muttered under her breath before ordering herself another glass. Blame her parents if you must. I think it's a beautiful name myself. But getting back to Miss Perkins, she hasn't published for quite a few years now. How's her health? Fine, as far as I know. To tell you the truth, we're not in daily contact. You're aware she lives in Venice, and she's not on email. Yes, I've been talking to Sterling about her and Arnold Otterbridge, working on these strange notebooks he left behind. I'd be interested in finding out what Miss Perkins knows about them. <clears throat> listen, Ra sipped her wine and assessed Paul silently. At last she said, listen, I have an idea. Why don't you go pay Ida a visit after Frankfurt? I'll arrange it. Do you think she'd see me? That would be fantastic, Roz. I don't know how to thank you. Just remember, you can't talk poetry with her. She detests literary types and suck-ups. Roz, I promise I won't forget. Don't, because if you start going la-di-da on her, you're toast. I give you my word. They finished their double decaf espressos, and Paul paid for their lunch. Two salad niçoise and Roz's three glasses of falangina to his one. He planted a noisy kiss on each cheek and put her in a taxi. He rode the bus down Fifth Avenue to give himself time to daydream a little. He couldn't keep from fantasizing about what it would be like to be in Ida's presence, to actually hear her speak. He was af half afraid that when she did open her mouth, he'd be so overwhelmed that what 
she said, would go in one ear and out the other, and he'd come away with nothing but the memory of his own fascination. Okay, thanks. I have been in the old Farrah Strauss offices, and I can testify to the verisimilitude of the description <laughs> that Jonathan made, the linoleum, yeah. Yeah, the linoleum. Yeah. The curtain, 30-year-old curtains, yep. I the self-defeating linoleum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could tell you were, I think most of us could tell you were having some memories there because you were giggling while you were reading. I know, that's <laughs> terrible. I'm so sorry about that's that. That's great. <laughs> no, it sort of, it adds, it makes us wonder exactly People what. People would laugh at their own jokes. Or what just that just looks like. <laughs> well, it also tends to buoy the audience <laughs> along, I think. Um, Ken, you mentioned the word verisimilitude. I wonder if you could each, maybe just as a launch question here, talk about um, Roger, your writing vis-a-vis -vis Homer, and Ken, your writing vis-a-vis -vis Dominic Strauss-Kahn. Just the way that trying to get to the truth of who these people are mm -hmm. uh, affected what you were writing, how it limited or expanded it in some way. Uh, I go? First, yeah. Oh, so the, the, the um, principal, well, the novella in this, in this book uh, that's about a a 62-year-old um, French economist who's the head of the Interna International Monetary Fund who, um, who has a lot of sex on his mind, uh, while at the same time he's thinking about um, uh, saving the European economy by, by, um, by uh, bailing out the Greeks. It's all fiction. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Though I have, you know, like, as I said at the beginning of American Hustle, if you remember that, that movie, there was a, um, a disclaimer that said some of this stuff actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of the story is, in fact, inspired by the events from, from um, the Dominic Strauss-Kahn affair. I obviously, if you read it, you'll see I use a lot of the, a lot of the reported material, what's known, what's known about um, Con. And I set, I set it in the same place as, you know, the Sophie Tell in New York. And I don't try to go too um, far. Um, but then I make stuff up. You know, in all fiction, no matter how, how cl close it is, you're always making stuff up to make the story work. And um, uh, that's, that's what I did with that. What, what I really was amazed by in the Coup de Food was you you keep to all the facts but you create this this character around them that's so extreme and funny and horrific uh that you can't quite believe that that's the real Dominic Strauss-Kahn and maybe it isn't maybe you know that's the thing i mean i you create a character as 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 you you keep track of the Dominic muse but very often they're fictional characters. I always, people say, well, how do you, you know, is this character you, is this character, whatever, you know, and so I always say, well, that's who I might be if I was somebody else, which is, uh, one of my stories is about a 13-year-old um, Russian girl who has her first, in one of my other books, a 13-year-old Russian girl who has her first period um, the day Stalin dies. Obviously that's not me, but if it was me, that's who I would be. So I was just kind of like, you know, linguistic perhaps, but um, you talk about a character. I don't know what the real Dominic Strauss-Kahn is like. But the, the, the Ken Kalfas' Dominic Strauss-Kahn talks to the woman, the, 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 the maid, and tries to, tries to understand it from her point of view through his cracked, you know, and that, that, I find that so, it's so well, funny and so Terrible, terrifying. Well, well thank you. Time. And I don't know if the real Dominic Strauss Khan would really care about that, but my character does. But his caring about it is the most monstrous thing of yeah. all, I think. You know. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. 
And how about you, Jonathan, vis-a-vis -vis the Homer character? Just what way did that? Well, I think, I think that in comedy, the, the, the way comedy works is by exaggeration, I think. So um, the Homer Stern character uh, is, I mean, I was drawing from a very colorful person in, the, in him. And most of the things he says in the books, he actually said. <laughs> but, but, there, but just by the fact of positing it as fiction gives it a kind of outsized quality, I think, that, that um, uh, it's just like you, there are many things in real life that you can't put into fiction because they don't, they don't seem, pl you know, the plausibility level that you're allowed in fiction is very low, I think. <laughs> so if you, if you go beyond that, you're already in the area, in the aura, in the region of um, satire, I think. <laughs> I think the key word there is outsize. We both, we both are talking about how we both take the character and push him a little bit to make him more comprehensible to us. But if, if he's bigger, he's more, he's, easy, he's easier to see. Mm -hmm. Real people are outrageous, you know, and if you, if you, so sometimes you have to bring them down to make them seem realistic. And I think there's a quality of uh, the not quite realistic in my book. That was one thing I was trying to do. Yeah, we had a long discussion about this last week with a couple of other writers who were here who were talking about outsized characters from the perspective sort of, um, of, of a much smaller character within history. And that, that was a really effective mechanism for dealing with these big personalities and fictionalizing them, which is not something you do, but that's sort of Paul in the book. Paul is the Paul is the one who's looking up at these, you know, wide-eyed at these big, big people. And actually, part of the story of the book is how uh, he grows up and they become less big. And uh, so the book, in some ways, shifts from satirical picture to something a little more, uh, more Bildung's Rom Romani, mm -hmm. you know. How about we involve the audience here? Um, does anybody have a question? Would like to contribute a question? Yeah, right here in the front row, Nancy, if we could get a microphone. Ken, I just wanted to ask how autobiographical, if at all, un is. Um, more, autobi more autobiographical than <laughs> um, yes, 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 pretty, uh, um, pretty much, pretty much. Um, and that sort of reflects my life as a struggling young writer. And um, that little street that I talk about you know, that is this he lives on, I think in my head is Cater Street, where we live when we first came to Philadelphia. Um, of course, it's exaggerated a little bit. Um, I don't think I'm crazy, um, but yeah, it's a it's a lot of the experience, and it was something that set. I had told my editor figuring this out. To explain, you know, nowadays you don't send stuff by post; you 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 email. It's a whole different level of distraction and wishing and warning. So I wanted to set in the past for the actual mechanical aspect of, um, and the story goes on like that, and sort of reflects what it was like in my twenties and thirties trying to get trying to get published. Also, it reflects the era when there were a lot of small magazines. Uh, <laughs> it's still out there. It's still out there. Some are very good, but yeah, yes. Now, they were, now a lot of them are migrated online. Um, Another question? Yeah, here in the brown. Mike is coming. Uh, Mr. Kalfus, did, did you... Did you uh, did you factor in the tough cookies in uh, Strauss Kahn's uh, story? You know, the, the, the maid, they, they said that the maid was poor, immigrant, devout Muslim, and he was Jewish, French president candidate, you know, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you factor in, in, in your story, all those tough cookies and made sense out of them? Um, whether I made sense of it, yes. Those, those, the, the characters are pretty much as, um, 
He is Jewish. Um, he has a, triple, a double-barreled name, though not the hyphen, because they said, no, that would not work. Really. But, um, and I've, I drew from, from all the characters who were involved in the story, I, in the real-life story, I, I, drew, I, drew my, I drew my characters, um, what I could learn about them. And then I invented, invented stuff. But yes, all those elements, um, I think a lot of the elements about the case, not so much necessarily the fact that he was Jewish, I don't think. No, it, it comes up in my story, actually, it does. Actually, it does, actually, um, in the discussion of circumcision. Um, but, uh, yeah, all, all, all those elements are there, and I, I, try to make, I try to make them all work together. Next question, yeah, here on our left. Jonathan, Jonathan, did your experience as an editor prepare you for being edited? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, this whole experience of being published, being edited and published is um, quite, quite educational, let's put it that way. No, uh, was there suffering involved? What? <laughs> was there suffering involved? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say my editor, Robin Desser, was incredibly uh, good with me and good in the sense of being very, very demanding and making me go back to things many, many times, which I was very uh, sometimes discomfited by but very grateful for in the long run. So, uh, it, but it didn't, it didn't, uh, it's a very, you know, it's just, there are two sides to every story, and the uh, the side of being uh, being on the other side of the table is it's a totally different one. Did it affect your? Just to follow up on that, I'm over here, Jonathan, to your right. Sorry, I'm just following up on his question. Yes, more sympathy for the writers. Than Absolutely, <laughs> I'm so I'm so empathetic. <laughs> But I'm going to be tougher, like Robin. <laughs> and any More empathetic and tougher. And you were you published with Knopf. I mean, are they something of a rival in the industry for oh. FSG? Oh yes, we're definitely friendly rivals. But and I'm very. I don't know whether I'm glad or I know I'm glad, but I'm also annoyed at how good they are. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great cover, by the way. <laughs> no, they've been terrific. Another question. Uh, yeah, right here in the fourth row. I'm wondering, I mean, both of you wrote essentially about the past, and Ken, I know a lot of your earlier stories also are about the past. I'm wondering, is it easier in a certain respect to write about the past than write something that is taking place right now? Well, I'll just myself say that my book starts in the past and goes into the future. So, so uh, it's... A lot of it is about the changes in publishing, and it, it in a counterfactual, uh, satirical way, it goes into the future too. Uh, a lot of my, a lot of my stories, not well in this book too, actually. A lot of times, I, I have used history or historical settings as a way to get into a story, not because it's easier, but because sometimes there are stories within history that that give you, you know, that you want to work, that you want to explore. Um, it's not necessarily easier or better or anything like that, but particularly my Russian, so two of my books are set, two of my books are set in, in uh, Russia, and most of the, and the novel and most of the stories in the second, in the, second in, in the book of short stories, many of them are set in the past, because I wanted to explore themes in Russian, in, in, in Russian history, and the Russian, stories that Russian history presents to us, and very often history will do that. Um, yeah. and, and this story I just read today, I just wanted to write something autobiographical about my, my, my past. Um, if, I'd, if I'd done, I don't know, it would have been more of a stretch to do it. My editor actually wanted, at one point, wanted me to, to make it contemporary. And, you know, the emails and stuff like that, I, I think that's not what I had in mind, you know, so we didn't do it. <laughs> question or two before we end? Yeah, right here in the middle. 
Jonathan, I was just wondering, how much time was it be, be, after your final draft you submitted your, your book till like, may, do you have many rejection letters or what was the period of time till it was actually accepted for publication? For this book? Yeah. Well, it was, um, Robin had published my last poetry book, so I didn't actually, I mean, I showed it to her and she, eventually she agreed to publish it, not right away. So uh, I don't know if, is that, is that what you're asking? Drafts, how many drafts there were? I, I just submitted it to, to her, so I, I didn't send it to anyone else. I know, <laughs> very lucky. But I paid for it. I paid for it in blood, sweat, and tears, I promise. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, many of the individual stories in this collection were rejected many, many times. <laughs> yes, we know. <laughs> you we know, know. Yeah. <laughs> I've had lots of re rejections in the past, though, for my poetry books, if that makes you feel better. <laughs> How about one last question? Right there in the middle, now it rose back. Uh, this this is for Jonathan. Um, you, in the reading that you, you just did, you you described a milieu that really doesn't exist anymore in publishing, and and you, you say the book goes into the future, but um, I haven't read it. So I was wondering if you can describe from your own life and and um, how this, this profession, which was kind of a noble profession, where people had this um, sort of noble idea of what they were doing, how that's changed today when there's so many few, fewer publishing houses. It's, 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 uh, there's no money in it. Um, there are no more lunches, three, 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 three glass lunches. Um, we don't have martinis at lunch, but we still have lunch. You're invited to lunch, Ken. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and you are too. But, um, no, I, one, of the, one of the core points of my books actually is that the core experience of, the, of publishing, which is the, the author-editor um, connection, which I just talked about, remains the same in the business, even though there's no more dirty linoleum. What, what we have now instead are these open plan offices, which are even worse than the old offices, in my opinion. We don't have that. But, but the actual relationship between the author and the editor or publisher remains very deep and personal. And I think Ken would say that too, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> or it can, anyway. It can be. I mean, I've had several editors. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, know it's, I know what it's like in fiction, as it, yeah. as it is in, in this. I would say it doesn't necessarily reflect my... Um, not in Philadelphia, which makes me a little bit outside the, the orbit of, of New York publishing. I'm friendly with my editors. I like my editors, um, but you know, uh, um, it's, not, it's not quite as old world. I don't think as as Farris Strauss, perhaps for, for me at least. And I say I'm in, I'm in here in Philadelphia. Well, it's only an hour by train. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think all right. What I'll, maybe I'll revise revise my text. I've been edited here, and and say that in. That that can still be at the core of the experience is the, the the editor's love for the author's work and their collaboration on it, and I, I think that um, from what Ken was telling me earlier about the editor he had on this book, it sounded like she had a very how would I say a very intuitive understanding of what he was doing and that they worked together really well on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially for the um, novella, um, the uh, for Kuta Fudra. Um You know, it, it depends a lot on the relationship between on you on on the, on the writer, and it depends on the editors. And uh, this is my third publisher, so maybe that's also part of the um, things wrong with me. <laughs> uh, but but that may also be um, part of it too. 
I mean, I don't, my editor, I love her dearly and I think she's great, but we don't see the book exactly the same way. She was always pushing it more towards realism and I always saw it as um, satire or as sort of out, you know, Outside. cartoony in some, some, in many different minor ways. So we didn't exactly see it the same way, but we both, but we were both in it together in a very committed way. And that's still there, I think. Well, please join me in thanking Jonathan Galassi and Ken Koppel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you.